Hello, everybody. A very warm good uh, good uh, good afternoon to everybody. Good evening to everybody. Uh, um, uh, it's a festive uh, season that we are at now, and uh, we are uh, towards the end of a year, which has been troublesome, which has been hard, and we have fought through it. Uh, we are all hoping that 2021 would be a better year for all of us in all aspects. Today. Here we are going to uh, have a talk uh, by Professor Rizavi. It is a part of a lecture series, a joint lecture series that we are having um, uh, between Aligarh Society of History and Archaeology, Asha, and Ganga Jamini. Um, in this lecture series, as you all must be familiar, uh, we have two lectures per week. On Fridays, we have lectures uh, which deal with sources of Indian history, mostly. And on Sundays, we talk about certain um, uh, topics which talk about uh, the shared culture that we have had, the syncretic culture that we have had. And um, today's lecture is a part of that uh, aspect of the lecture series that we have. Unfortunately, I'm sure that you people were uh, familiar, you people knew that today Dr. Catherine Scofield was supposed to speak to you. She was supposed to speak to you on a very interesting topic, that uh, uh, a topic which interests the masses, which interests the historians, which interests the academics alike. And the topic was how Mughals were perceived by the Indian film industry. I think we all are uh, uh, familiar with the popular uh, culture that there is. Uh, we have all seen mughal -e azam we have all seen Jodha Akbar, and we know that there is a particular um, narrative that has been uh, uh, perpetuated by Bollywood regarding Mughals. So that was a very interesting topic. We don't need to be disheartened. We will have uh, Catherine, Dr. Catherine Scofield with us uh, in uh, a few weeks. Uh, today, uh, unfortunately, she was unwell. She had some health issues, and that is why she couldn't be with us. In her stead, we have uh, Professor uh, Ali Nadeem Rezavi. Uh, he needs no introduction. Uh, I think all the viewers who have been uh, following these lecture series would be familiar with uh, Professor Rezavi. Uh, he has been hosting these lectures. And today, he is going to talk to us about a very intriguing topic, another very intriguing topic. And that is uh, the, the theme of the uh, lecture is was Akbar literate? And uh, this is a question that historians and academicians have been grappling with uh, for a long time. They have done researches. Uh, for example, Ellen Smart has put up uh, his views regarding this particular topic, and he has argued that it was probably dyslexia that Akbar had, uh, dyslexia, uh, the, which became uh, known to uh, most of the people through uh, Amir Khan starer Tare Zameen Par. And uh, it was because of this dyslexia that Akbar could not read uh, and write, and that is why he could not be literate. Uh, so what was this, uh, what is this idea behind Akbar being illiterate? Uh, what is this narrative? And uh, we know that uh, from uh, time immemorial, the idea of illiteracy being associated with great figures, with great thinkers or with great uh, religious figures in that sense is something that uh, somehow adds to their legitimacy, somehow adds to their worth, somehow adds to their, uh, the, the, the greatness that they, uh, you know, that they have, that they exhibit. So we are going to dwell on these uh, issues. Um, I have already uh, told you people how uh, Professor Rizavi doesn't need any introduction and he uh, is a teacher uh, to uh, us. He has been my teacher through the, um, through the masters uh, and he has also taught Akbar uh, to uh, a, a, a number of batches of uh, masters of history. So uh, I uh, now, this no, not taking much of the time, uh, I now hand over uh, the podium, hand over the virtual podium to Professor Rezavi. Uh, over to you, Professor Rezavi. Uh, thank you, Lubna uh, uh, Irfan. Uh, uh, as uh, Lubna said that uh, uh, today we were expecting uh, Catherine Schofield once again, who was supposed to talk to us about uh, the Mughals' music and the movies. But unfortunately, 
uh, yesterday uh, evening uh, she informed that uh, uh, she had certain health issues uh, due to which it would not be possible for her to uh, be with us uh, today evening. I promised uh, her and I'm promising all of you that very soon uh, we would be having uh, Dr. Scofield amongst us. And that is a topic which shall be dealt uh, in this series, uh, if a little delayed. Uh, today, as uh, we uh, has been just announced, that we are talk going to talk about a topic which concerns uh, with Akbar and his deficiency in the three R's reading, writing, etc. Um, there are a number of, you know, theories which have been given. Uh, generally, it is said that amongst all the Mughals, uh, Akbar was the person uh, who was unlettered. And that is why most of the things were read out to him. And he could not, I mean, uh, we know that Babur left an account, Jahangir left an account, but not Akbar. Babur and Jahangir are considered as two intellectually inclined rulers who also had exceptionally developed literary tastes. Both are credited to have penned their autobiographies while Babur was also an accomplished poet to boot. Not only these two, Aurangzeb too is supposed to have been a scholar and many letters written by him survive. Humayun too was a poet, cultivated scholars and maintained a well-stocked library. His sister was a scholar of Persian and an author of a book. As far as Shah Jahan is concerned, again we know that he patronized, not only patronized scholars, but was also a well-versed man. The only Mughal emperor about whom there is almost a consensus that he was unlettered is the greatest of them all, Jalaluddin Muhammad Akbar. Most historians and scholars hold that Akbar could never read and write. And that is why during his reign, as I said, a large number of texts were illustrated so that he may be able to visualize what was being written. Incidentally, while we say this, we forget that this was a tradition among the Timurids and Akbar was not the first of the Timurids who was getting the manuscripts illustrated. We know that even Amir Taimur, a large number of manuscripts had been illustrated during his period and he was not unlettered. We are also told that as Akbar could not read, texts were orally communicated to him as he intently listened. But we also know the fact that once again, this was a usual common practice. In fact, uh, almost all the Mughal emperors had manuscripts and texts read out to them. We know that even a person like Jahangir, who is credited to have written Tuzuka Jahangiri, also used to, you know, uh, have people who would read out not only the documents and letters, but also the manuscripts. So in other words, uh, here in this hour or so, we would try to re revisit this myth and demonstrate through primary source material and certain, uh, you know, uh, writings which were done by contemporary historians and the later historians that Akbar contrary to popular belief, was able to read and write. Further, 
his stress on rational science and intellect led not only subjects like arithmetic being included in curriculum but even tabulations being included in his official history being written on his orders by abul fazal in fact uh, the tabulations which have been incorporated by abul fazal uh, in his uh, akbar nama which is now known as ain e akbari uh, is in fact one of the remarkable feats of akbar himself akbar's policies in fact reflect his deep knowledge of contemporary philosophies which were too complex for an illiterate to understand if akbar was literate as i am alluding then why did he pretend that he was unlettered why this type of myth was allowed to be developed and popularized this is yet another major, major question in which we uh, we would be delving into and trying to find an answer babar the founder of the mughal dynasty was a literate or a remarkable prose writer and a poet his bamair the babar nama is an autobiography which is one of its kind he is also said to have patronized a host of learned men humayun too was a scholar with a cultivated taste for literature art and science especially mathematics geography and astronomy in his administration if one believes khwan the mir the learned classes the literati and the scientists that is ahle saadat were placed at the very top now let us deal with this general belief akbar uh, as far as akbar was concerned he could neither read or write we know that akbar had books read out to him on a daily basis manuscripts in large numbers were illustrated and the reason which in fact abul fazal has given for it i read out one uh, you know a passage from akbar nama in the volume 2 uh, abul fazal says and i quote him one day at a private party of friends his his majesty who had conferred on several the pleasure of drawing near him remark there are many that hate painting but such men i dislike it, it appears to me as if a painter had quite peculiar means of recognizing god for a painter in sketching anything that has life is devising its limbs one after the other must come to feel that he cannot bestow individuality upon his work and be thus forced to think of god the giver of life and will thus increase in knowledge unquote from a very early age akbar was schooled by humayun who appointed a number of tutors that is ataliq one after the other two of them were quite famous khwaja jalaluddin mahmud bujuk who had been in the service of mirza askari and had subsequently joined humayun and all of us know about bairam khan khane khana the first teacher however when akbar was 5 years of age was mulla zada samuddin ibrahim but on the very first day itself it is said that akbar hid and did not attend his class later he was dismissed on the charge that he was wasting time in pigeon flying bayazid bayat uh, one of the uh, you know temporary uh, contemporary authors of akbar's period to narrate a story of 1551 which he had heard from akbar's own lips in 1571 72 as to how once akbar took the help of munim khan to take a days leave from the maktab of usamuddin 
which was not liked by Humayun, who asked him not to repeat this mistake again. And this has been reported by, uh, by Azid Bayad in his Taskerai Humayun Wagbar. Subsequent to him, Molana Bayazid had been appointed. Later on, another tutor who was appointed was Molana Abdul Qadir. Yet another tutor of Akbar was Mir Abdul Latif, who was appointed when Akbar was in his teens. But in spite of these attempts at schooling, it is said that Akbar remained unlettered. In fact, uh, this fact that Akbar remained unlettered is attested to by two contemporary you know, authorities of that period. In a report filed by Father Monzeret, uh, which has been published in the memoirs of the Asiatic, Asiatic Society of Bengal uh, in 1914, Father Monzeret, in, uh, in this memoir, he writes, and I quote uh, from these uh, memoirs of Asiatic Society of Bengal, Akbar ordered learned men to explain through discourse in his presence religious, philosophical, and historical matters. He had the power of great memory and judgment, the patience of listening to others, and the ability to join in the discussion enthusiastically. He knew about a great many things and he was constantly learning. Not only did he compensate for, and I stress, for his ignorance of things written, but what is more, he explained difficult things plainly and simply. Although he was totally ignorant of reading and writing, Mark it, the words ignorant of reading and writing. No one who did not already know this would think that he was illiterate. This is what Father Mongolet says. Very point blank that Akbar did not know he was ignorant of reading and writing. Not only the Jesuit father, but Akbar's own son Jahangir in his memoirs also has the almost the same words to say about Akbar. And I quote Jahangir from his Tuzum. My father always associated with the learned of every creed and religion, especially with pundits and learned of India. Although he was, and he uses the term ummi, an illiterate. So much became clear to him through constant intercourse with the learned and wise in his conversation with them, that no one knew that he was, he, uh, he uh, uh, knew him to be an illiterate. And he was so acquainted with the niceties of verse and prose compositions that his deficiency was not thought of. Mark these words of Jahangir, where Jahangir has used the term Ummi for his father, the same word had occurred in um, uh, Muslim history and theology for a very sacred personality of Islam. We will come to that later on. According to Ellen Smart, uh, he is uh, one of those who took up to write on this topic and uh, he wrote exactly on uh, this very topic. Uh, I mean, I have taken uh, the, the, the title of today's uh, you know, talk based on the article with Ellen Smart had written, Akbar, the illiterate genius, which was published in 1981 uh, in a journal, which is brought out from, uh, you know, um, uh, Banaras Kala Darshan. And according to him, in this particular article, Smart says that Akbar was a dyslex. Dyslexia is a neurological disturbance which includes a specific syndrome involving difficulty in learning the conversational meaning of verbal symbols and inability to associate the sound with symbol 
in appropriate fashion. We have evidence of Abul Fazal, dated 1556, that one day when Akbar was under the tutelage of Mir Sayyid Ali and Khwaja Abdul Samad, Akbar drew with his pencil a sketch of a person with all his limbs separated. When asked, Akbar explained that it was Hemu. But then this was an incident which happened before Hemu had actually been slain. Smart takes it to be a typical example of dyslexia. But as I said, that Akbar reportedly drew the separate limbs at a time when Hemu was yet to be slain. Incidentally, at Fatehpur Sikri, in one of the palaces, the Khwabgah, where Akbar is supposed to have rested, uh, there is a painting, a beautiful painting, where there is a deity sitting in between and all around him, you know, uh, are, uh, you know, um, persons with their limbs, uh, you know, dissected and uh, thrown randomly all around. Uh, it's almost it, that uh, painting reminds you of what Akbar had draw, uh, drawn uh, in 1556. But if this was so, if Akbar was actually a dyslexic. How could he be trained as a painter? And we know that Akbar was well versed in the art of painting. Now, I would try to lay before you a number of points to argue that probably Akbar was neither unlettered nor uneducated. Let me take the first point. Was it possible for an illiterate to have actually understood or come under the influence of such profound philosophies as those of Ibn al-Arabi or the Shaqi philosophy of Shahbuddin Maktoul? And uh, there are modern scholars like Irfan Habib who have written, you know, articles on that. On, we find that uh, uh, it is not only at a very scratchy level that Akbar had followed uh, what Shahabuddin Maktoul had written or what uh, Ibn al-Arabi was saying. He had in-depth knowledge of both these philosophies. Akbar was not only aware but very familiar to the doctrine of Vahdatul Wujud, which is not a very uh, simple philosophical uh, you know, uh, thing to be understood. The development of Akbar's worldview subsequently to his being deeply influenced by the pantheism of Ibn al-Arabi is identified with the concept which he came up with, the Sulhekul. He also seems to be well aware about the philosophy of the Nur Nirgun Bhakti. In 1595, one finds Akbar emphasizing the absoluteness of divine reality and that one could reach it not by formal prayers but only by cultivating the self and with the help of a perceptor. This philosophy recalls to mind the teachings of Kabir and Nanak and this was not, this was not possible for an illiterate to comprehend. Secondly, this fact is also demonstrated by the new curriculum which was introduced by Akbar as far as his education system was concerned. You know, there is a chapter by Abul Fazal, Aine Amozish, Regulations Regarding Education which lays out the rules, curriculum, and system of education to be followed in these schools. And I'll read, try to read out uh, a, a very important passage 
which has been included while explaining what was the mode of education which was introduced by uh, you know akbar and i quote in every country but especially in hindustan boys are kept for years at school but where they learn the consonants and vowels a great portion of the life of these students is wasted by making them read many books his majesty orders that every school boy should first learn to write the letters of the alphabet and also learn to trace their several forms he ought to learn the shape and the name of each letter which may be done in two days when the boy should proceed to write the joined letters they may be practiced for a week after which the boy should learn some prose and poetry by heart and then commit to memory some verse in the praise of god or moral sentences each written separately care is to be taken that he learns to understand everything himself but the teacher may assist him a little he then ought for some time to do daily practice in writing a hemistich or verse and this way he will soon acquire a current hand the teacher ought specially to look after five things knowledge of the letters meaning of words the hemistich and the former lesson if this method of teaching is adopted a boy will learn in a month or even in a day what it took others years to understand so much so that people will get astonished every boy ought to read books on morals that is akhlaq hisab arithmetic the notation peculiar to mathematics that is siyaq falahat agriculture masahat menstruation hindisa geometry nujum astronomy ramal physiognomy tadbir e manzil household matters the rules of government that is siyasat e siyasat e madan tib medicine mantiq logic ilm e tabii physical sciences and theological sciences ilm e ilahi as well as tarikh history all of which may be gradually acquired in studying sanskrit students ought to learn vyakaran that is grammar nyai vedanta and patanjali no one should be allowed to neglect those things which the present time requires of this description of the mode of teaching in the schools that is madrasas at least makes it clear that under akbar a education was brought under state purview b emphasis was on a method to impart comprehension rather than merely learning by the system of rote thirdly the thrust was on the topic other than religious sciences with almost all the known branches of sciences being emphasized and lastly the teaching of the non muslim wards and students was also taken care of it is not only badayuni who is reporting uh, abul fazal who is reporting this badayuni also asserts this point when he laments and i quote badayuni reading of arabic and its learning was looked upon as crime and fiqh jurisprudence and tafsir that is exegesis of the quran hadith and their study was considered bad and disapproved of nujum astronomy hikmat philosophy tarikh history 
and afsana novels were cultivated and thought necessary emphasis emphasizing the importance given to the non religious curriculum and the fact that it was to be taught both to the muslims and non muslims badaini at yet another place informs us and i quote him in this year that is 1586 it was ordered that all sections har qaum should give up arabic sciences uloom e arabiya and apart from uloom e gariba that is external sciences like nujum astronomy hisab mathematics tib medicine and falsafa philosophy should study nothing else the date the date of this was found as qasat e fazl schools appear to have been constructed on imperial orders since the reign of humayun he had established a school at delhi on the river bank in honor of zainuddin khafi mahamanaga the foster mother of akbar opened a madrasa known as madrasa e begum which was also known as khairul manazil it was a residential institution with students residing in the rooms of this double storied structure the classes were held in the hall at agra according to badaini there was another great college being run in the hospice of the learned scholar shah mir there are numerous references to a madrasa meant for the royal princes and princesses being run inside the imperial palace at fatehpur sikri monzare describes it when he mentions that akbar appointed him to teach the royal wards apart from this fact there is another point which tells us about the type of educated mind which akbar had during his period there was a stress on aql rationalism and thus a stress on subjects like arithmetic possibly abul fazl zain e akbari is the first text which deals with statistical data and tabulations and all this was included on the insistence of akbar himself now i would come to yet another point uh which uh in fact shows that akbar was himself a poet of some sort arif kandhari in his account of 1571 um and look now you may please put up that page uh, for us everyone to see what arif kandhari has written in 1571 at a time when akbar was marching towards lahore and stopped at near batala and jalandhar for hunt in fact arif kandhari cites a few verses of a ghazal composed by akbar market arif kandhari says that it is a ghazal which was composed by akbar unfortunately this whole passage is missing from the english translation which had been done by dr tasneem ahmed formerly of the ichr indian council of historical research incidentally this translation has many portions lifted straight from a translation attempted by uh, p saran earlier but let us uh, leave uh, 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 what type of translation uh, arif uh, of arif kandhari has been done by tasneem ahmed uh, before you as you can see are uh, is uh, are, are certain of the uh, verses from a ghazal which had been composed by akbar uh, which he says uh, which arif kandhari mentions uh, that uh, uh, du- during uh, his account of 1571 uh, in there is a very i mean um, uh, uh, short verses 
چیتا پادشاہ کالا گرفت خون دش راچو لالا گرفت باش ہوشیار اے حریف کے باز ساقی تند خو پیالہ گرفت بہر خون ریزی گلو لالا ابر دامن زے سنگ جالا گرفت بوت شارا پری و شان بسیار دل برے دگر از بتالار گرفت شاہ اکبر ببی زے لطف اللہ ہندرا بخت قبالہ گرفت آئی وونٹ ٹرانسلیٹ دی ہول آف اٹ بٹ آئی وڈ جسٹ پوائنٹ آؤٹ دیٹ دیز ورسز ڈو شو دیٹ اکبر مے ہیو بین اے پوئٹ آف سم ڈگری بٹ ہی واز نتھنگ نیئر ٹو واٹ بابر ہیڈ بین آئی مین وی آلسو نو دیٹ بابر Uh, was also a poet and he has left behind a number of his verses in the Babur uh, Nama. Uh, so uh, if you compare uh, the verses of Babur, which incidentally originally were in Turkish, later on translated by Abdul Rahim Khan Khanan while he was translating uh, the text of the Babur Nama into Farsi. He also translated them into Farsi, but they are much more mature. they, they uh, show babar to be a very literate person here these verses which have been quoted cited by arif kandari do point out that yes akbar had this much you know education that he could say verses he could com- com- compose verses but these verses are jiske kehte hain ki they wo koi paaye ke sher nahi hai they are just of an ordinary person uh, but but still they do depict that akbar too had some sort of a training uh, uh, after all uh, when i started with this lecture i told you that he had a large number of tutors who taught him literature history and everything and that is why uh, uh, he was at least this much uh, you know well versed that he could compose his own poetry Now let us come to another aspect. Uh, Lubna, can you uh, now put up the uh, second slide? There are at least two examples of Akbar's handwriting which are extant. A third uh, one also survives, which Robert Skelton thinks might be a specimen of Akbar's writing. The first, uh, which is now before you, is folio 1a of garrett's zafar nama and this has been reproduced by ellen smart as well as well as by arnold in his behzad and paintings in the zafar nama both uh, first of all uh, t arnold published it uh, later on it was published by ellen smart now if you pay attention uh, to this page to the lower left of the central medallion is the letter alif beneath which is written farwardin the name of the first month of the year in the ilahi era instituted by akbar in 1584 below that in another handwriting is written in persian and i read the translation of that This kalima is in the blessed khat of Arsh Astani, that is Akbar. Mir Jamaluddin Inju presented this copy to His Majesty in the Darul Khilafah, Agra. The same Alif and same Farwardin, the, month of, uh, the name of the month, but a smaller, but in a small, smaller script is found on folio 1a of gulistan uh, may we have the third slide please which once belonged to marki of butte the words are found almost 
in the same position as in the earlier manuscript. And below it, uh, we find uh, Jahangir's writing. In his hand, Jahangir writes, Dast Khate Mubarak Hazrat Shah Baba Akbar Padshah. He attests to the fact that both these words, Aleph and Farwardin, have been written by the auspicious hand of my father Akbar. The page contains notes and seals of Shah Jahan, Jahanara, Darashiko, and some others. Let us have the next slide. The writing proposed by Skelton to be that of Akbar is to be found on the first illustration in uh, a manuscript which is known as Tarikh e Khandan e Taimuria. Uh, this painting is before you, unfortunately. I don't have uh, a colored reproduction uh, of this painting. I tried to get it, but it only the uh, black and white version is available. The painting shows Amir Temur as a boy playing with toys in the company of friends. At the top is written Amir Temur Shah Sahib Quran. The painting is by Daswant who committed suicide in 1584. Robert Skelton believed that the opening words, next one please, Amir Tamur Shah Sahib Quran, you could see the, uh, you know, um, actual writing which is there. Skelton believes these opening words are written by Akbar himself. An assumption which is quite plausible because if you look closely, then you would find that there is some similarity, same childishness in the writing as we found in the earlier two words, which had been uh, attested to have been written by Akbar, uh, uh, by his son Jahangir himself. All these uh, three specimens display a hesitancy in vertical strokes and a hand which is not very used to writing. So, my contention is that if Akbar could both read and write, howsoever childishly, he could comprehend, but he could com comprehend complex philo philosophical thoughts and display an intellect with a worldview, why does he himself and Abul Fazal, as well as Jahangir, try to depict him as unlettered? In fact, as we have seen, Jahangir uses the term Ummi for his father. Let us remember that Abul Fazal has tried to gloss over all the defects of Emperor Akbar. We all of us know that when Akbar fainted, he had, uh, you know, um, epilepsy, a bout of epilepsy during one of the hunts. Abul Fazal says that it was a divine intervention. Just like the Prophet would faint at a time when the Wahi was being brought to him, Abul Fazal says that when Akbar was also in divine communion, after all Akbar was a divine king, he would commune with God and when he was in communion, he would in fact um, look as if he had fainted. And this is not the only time. 
एट ईच एंड एवरी ओकेजन अबुल फजल हैज वन यू नो ग्लॉस और द अदर टू हाइड एनी ऑफ द डिफेक्ट ऑफ हिस्स मेजेस्टी सो वाई इज ही सो ओपन वाई डज ही टेक प्राइड इन कॉलिंग अकबर अनलेटर्ड Why? Because howsoever childishly, when Akbar did write, when Akbar could paint, when Akbar could understand the complex philosophies, when Akbar could compose verses, howsoever badly, why does? abul fazal for all the for, of all the people calls him an ummi jahangir too uses the same term ummi for his father now what is ummi what is the meaning of ummi it doesn't simply mean unlettered the term ummi has a different connotation in the world of islam in the muslim world the term ummi is generally used for the prophet in fact the muslims take pride that their prophet was an ummi in that context it stands for the word uh, ummi stands for a person who did not acquire education from any human being the prophet was an ummi as he had no teacher except god akbar and possibly abul fazal probably wanted to place himself in that very position remember that abul fazal has a passage where he draws uh, tries to draw parallel between a divine king a divine birth and akbar he narrates the whole incident of alankoa just to point out that you know just like mary who conceived without the intervention of a man the son of a god in the same fashion the lineage of the moguls tracing from changes and temur had that seed within itself all effort is made by abul fazal in the akbar nama to posit akbar as a divinely inspired being as i said he descended from the immaculate conception of elatqua and in spite of a number of tutors who were appointed for him he actually learned from none but god before 1578 he shown to have had mystical experiences and psychological imbalances he would go into a trance and mutter in incomprehensible words and abul fazal would say he was in communion with god just like the prophet who would go into a trance when gabriel would visit him with a word of god it is not what the that no such communion is reported after 1578 after seven, in 1579 with the failure of mazar through which akbar tried to take up a divine position akbar started pursuing the policy of sulehul the discussions in the ibadat khana from 1575 to 77 and then from 77 to 79 convinced him of the futility of following the religions from 58 uh, from 1580 81 as father bonzeret claimed by claiming all religions to be true akbar was in fact negating all religions now he had no need to pose like a prophet it was a triumph of rationalism 
and thus now no mystical experiences are reported at all by 1590s akbar appears to have abandoned all pretexts of being unlettered as well and the crucial evidence for this comes from an account of faizi sarhindi ilahadat faizi sarhindi in his akbar nama which is a manuscript at the british library narrates that one late night in 18th on 18th june 1590 which was shabe miraj he was called uh, by the emperor where he in the presence of naqib khan showed akbar the manuscript of the history of jauhar aftab ji akbar on reading a passage exclaimed that this could never be the writing of jauhar who lacked literacy and could not have written in such a manner before 1590s akbar would never read but here what faizi sarhindi is telling us is that uh, 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 you know uh, uh, the manuscript was taken by akbar himself and he read out of, uh, read out the passage when naqib khan was also standing and read out the passage and said ke ye ho hi nahi sakta ye jauhar aftab ji aisa likh hi nahi sakta hai it is not his writing he never writes in this manner faizi sarhindi then explained that yes that was the case and he had in fact carried out the necessary corrections and edited the text luckily faizi says that khane khanan who had just arrived authenticated the fact and the emperor then offered faizi sarhindi to join the translation bureau and translate some works of hindi to persian here in this whole episode which has been narrated by faizi sarhindi akbar reads akbar understands and akbar points out an error to faizi sarhindi ke ye to jo author jiske bare mein aap keh rahe hain wo likh hi nahi sakta hai uski writing hi nahi na uska andaaz hai na uski writing hai aur phir faizi sarhindi ye likhte hain ke phir ab jab aftab jauhar aftab ji likhta hai ke faizi sarhindi ne accept kiya is cheez ko ke nahi sir ye uska likha hua nahi hai ये बल्कि मैंने उसको करेक्ट करके दिया था अकबर तब भी डाउटफुल थे एंड देन यू नो खाने खानान हु वाज प्रेजेंट देयर ही टोल्ड अकबर नो नो आई आई एम अ विटनेस टू द फैक्ट दैट फैजी सरंदी हैड बीन ट्रांसलेटिंग दिस एंड नाउ अकबर डिड नॉट से एनीथिंग अबाउट प्लेजरिज्म और एनीथिंग ही जस्ट ऑफर्ड सर्विस टू फैजी सरंदी एंड हु जॉइंड द ट्रांसलेशन ब्यूरो हियर दिस इज अ डायरेक्ट एविडेंस कि अकबर पढ़ते भी थे समझते भी थे उनके लिए वो जो आपने तारे जमीन पर यू हैव सीन इन मूवी दैट यू नो वर्ड्स स्टार्ट रोटेटिंग इन इन डिसलेक्सिया वन कैन नॉट रीड नाउ इन 1590 देयर इज एन एविडेंस अकबर इज रीडिंग अकबर इज अंडरस्टैंडिंग दिस होल डायरेक्शन ऑफ फेजी सरहंदी एक्सप्लिसिटली डिमॉन्स्ट्रेटेड अकबर रीडिंग दैक्स and being aware of the writing style of his court years as well so in short what i have to say here is th- uh, that akbar was in fact posing to be an ummi an illiterate why because he was trying to ape the prophet the prophet of islam abul fazal was mentioning this because his whole you know attempt was Uh, to put before the public the divine kingship of akbar just like the prophet of islam he was a ummi but the moment akbar realized ke ab islam se mazhab se uh, religion se uh, koi lena dena nahi hai there is a policy of sulekul where everyone uh, has to be given equal treatment monzeret claiming that in fact he is negating all the religions now akbar comes out openly now there is no pretension he can read and there are there are you know uh, evidence <coughs> that in his chamber akbar was reading a text and interpreting the text thank you very much
Thank you so much, sir, for uh, such a detailed talk about such an interesting topic. Um, I'm sure there would be many questions uh, because you've put forward certain important arguments about a topic uh, that has uh, uh, been intriguing the historians uh, for a long time. So uh, I'll start uh, with the questions that uh, are there. Uh, there are a number of them. Um, uh, there are certain questions, certain comments. So uh, there is this uh, uh, one um, uh, that has been shown on your screen that is uh, by Zoya Zedi. Uh, she asks, greatest of thinkers are known to be unlettered. Don't you think uh, that Akbar was probably one of them? Uh, that is what I have tried to argue. I think, yes. Uh, yes. That this, this was the pretension of Akbar. Uh, just yeah. like, some of the, I mean, uh, some of the great men do not uh, actually want to admit that they have been taught by others uh, who are uh, lesser than uh, them. And they always try to pretend that they have been uh, taught uh, by God himself, or they know everything. Uh, themselves, they, they, they have such a personality. And that is what I have tried to demonstrate today, basing on what Ellen Smart and others uh, had written. Uh, my particular opinion is that uh, though, uh, if you hurriedly read what Ellen Smart had written, but actually, if you go deep into the history of uh, Akbar's period, you would uh, realize that uh, uh, Akbar was not Amir Khan. Uh, he had no dyslexia, dyslexia as such, uh, possibly. And this was all pretension cooked up uh, to forward his particular uh, divine theory of kingship. Um, exactly. Uh, uh, there is another question uh, that has been put up to you by Zahid Hamid. And he asks, if he had acquired knowledge of history by Abul Fazl, and on what basis uh, we can conclude that Akbar was illiterate? No, I don't think that he acquired knowledge of history from Abul Fazl at all. In fact, as far uh, uh, we, we are very uh, sure uh, to know that even as far as uh, Akbar Nama is concerned, uh, it was compiled by Abul Fazal mm -hmm. on a large number of other histories which had been ordered to be compiled for the purpose of Abul Fazal writing an official history. Apart mm -hmm. from that, uh, there is another history which is much more comprehensive than uh, the, the uh, Akbar Nama of Abul Fazl, and that is uh, that uh, uh, Tariq Alfi, uh, which actually uh, is very voluminous. And unfortunately, uh, the whole uh, Tariq Alfi is not available to us in India, although it has been published in Iran. Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there were a large number of, uh, you know, writers, Bayazid, Bayad, Gulbatan, Banu Begum, uh, Johar Aftabchi, so on and so forth. Uh, uh, then for uh, the writing of uh, Ag uh, Akbar Nama, Ag Akbar opened the doors of the, uh, you know, uh, his own archives uh, from where he could take the material and the, uh, you know, uh, all the documents on which he would base the history. So I don't think that um, probably, I, I mean, I will go to an extent to say that both Abul Fazal and uh, Akbar were learning together about the past which was happening. Uh, we also know the fact that there are a number of recensions which were uh, are available for Akbar Nama. Possibly whenever Akbar would write anything, and that is true for almost all the writings of that period, they would first be read uh, back to the emperor and he would make necessary changes. So just to claim that it is Abul Fazal uh, who is you know, putting words into the mouth of the emperor is actually not correct. Sometimes it is vice versa. It is the emperor who is putting words into the mouth of the authors. Uh, so, uh, I mean, uh, who came first, the egg or the hen, I don't know. But still, I would say that uh, both Abul Fazal and Akbar uh, were at one uh, particular level. Both of them were scholars. Both of them were intellectuals and were trying to learn from the past. Exactly. With uh, Abul Fazl and Akbar, it's not really sure. Historians are always uh, debating uh, who influenced whom. 
and that's a very interesting uh, debate. Uh, and sir, as you mentioned, archives that Akbar collected. So there's a, a question related to that. Um, Mirza Hasnan asks, Emperor Akbar had uh, 24,000 books in his library. Where has uh, this library gone? Do we know something about this library? Does archaeological work have been done to discover it? Do we have any manuscripts surviving from this library? So he wants uh, to know about the archives that you mentioned. Uh, Mirza Hastain Sahab, I would recommend that once this COVID uh, scare is over, uh, do visit Europe. Uh, go to uh, Victoria Albert Museum, go to British Library, uh, go to a large number of other collections, uh, go to Smithsonian, go to Paris. Uh, uh, in fact, a large number of works which were once part of the Mughal Library, the Imperial Library, were smuggled out of this country. Uh, a number of works which are there uh, even in the Indian uh, collection, for example, Raza Library, Rampur, uh, at Khudabakh's library uh, in Patna, and uh, certain other, uh, uh, for example, uh, I know uh, for sure that even at a place like uh, the Mahmudabad Library, they very proudly show us that this is a manuscript which once belonged to Akbar. Or for that matter, this belongs to Shah Jahan. You know, uh, during the period uh, after the Ghadar, after 1857, even before that, there were a number of lootings, but especially after 1857, most of these, uh, you know, libraries were looted. Uh, some of them fortunately landed up in the foreign archives and collections. I say fortunately because at least there they have survived. Uh, uh, some of those works are now in private collections. And yes, a large number of them have also disappeared. Maybe some of them are still in private collections, which we are not being informed about. But we do know that a sizable number of the Mughal archives does survive. Uh, secondly, uh, I would say that as far as the physical remains of the library are concerned. Yes, mm. uh, we do have evidence uh, regarding some of them, not all of it. Uh, we know that a part of the library was also at Fatehpur Sikri and uh, till date, uh, there is a room at least which uh, through memory is known as the library of Akbar. Whether it was a library or not, but memory of the library survived even also amongst the villagers of Fatehpur Sikri who gave such names. Uh, presumably, uh, there did exist uh, these uh, places. Uh, in fact, most of the collections of these, uh, uh, you know, for example, at Amer, uh, uh, they have the library collections, uh, Amer uh, archives. Uh, much of the material is derived from the Mughals, apart from their own. Uh, so yes, um, much of it survives. Some of it has also been destroyed. Yes, and regarding that library structure at uh, Fatehpur Sikri, most of the guides also identify it as library. Guides who do not identify any structure correctly, but they also, in popular memory, that is, uh, there is a library that is associated with Akbar and that uh, attests to his scholarly um, background and his greatness as a scholar. Um, there are some uh, comments uh, that are there uh, and there are certain other questions. Uh, I would just read out some of the uh, questions which uh, are in uh, nature of a comment, uh, more like a comment than a question. Uh, uh, Dr. Zoya Zadi again uh, asserts how a kind of who was such a patron of arts, poetry, culture and such a great thinker who even tried to introduce a religion, Dine Ilahi, be illiterate. So uh, I think uh, that is what well, we uh, that's, a, that's a comment, uh, but uh, I'll just uh, answer to Dr. Zoya Zaidi. I mean, thank you, uh, Zoya Appa, for taking so much interest uh, in our programs. Uh, you are there uh, almost uh, on both the days of the week. Uh, thank you uh, uh, for I mean uh, giving us this 
uh, opportunity uh, because we feel encouraged when non historians join uh, your question is very uh, relevant but uh, uh, let me also say that there was no religion which was uh, circulated by but there was uh, deen e ilahi or kesha muhammadi or whatever you call it uh, was not actually a deen as i uh, tried to point out uh, uh, during the course of the lecture that uh, uh, some of the contemporaries for example uh, monzeret father monzeret a jesuit priest who was in akbar's court Uh, he thought that akbar was in fact negating all the religions uh, it is it would be i think a good idea if we can have a lecture on uh, religion but uh, i will uh, recommend uh, uh, dr zaidi that on my personal youtube page uh, 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 i have uploaded uh, a lecture on the religions uh, of the uh, medieval kings starting from sultanat coming down uh, to aurangzeb so if ever you find time i mean i have started from uh, uh, you know sultan mahmud of ghazna i ended with aurangzeb their religion uh, their attitude towards religion their policies uh, what they did uh, so possibly as far as akbar is concerned uh, he never patronized any religion in fact he negated all the religions and deen e ilahi was just uh, just like a silsila say the tishtiya silsila or the nanak panthi silsila he was very interested uh, to have a silsila in his name and that was all uh, nothing more than that uh, thank you sir for such detailed response yes sir uh, rana is quite right i mean uh, that is what mm -hmm. i tried to uh, say that uh, uh, you know just like the prophet you know he uh, akbar uh, you know we we when we uh, uh, write the textbooks or read the textbooks we only find the mention of sultan balban uh, who is said to have in his theory of kingship uh, taken up the position uh, next to god mm, or in in fact next to the uh, uh, prophet uh, removing the khalifa and everything uh, similar was the case with uh, akbar Uh, but he was more intelligent he did not do it in a very di direct manner uh, but uh, throughout you know uh, if you read abul fazl now fortunately uh, akbar nama is uh, you know present uh, in translation in a quite a few translations good translations uh, beverage uh, translation is there but apart from the beverage translation uh, we have the translation which has been done by the murthy library Uh, by that uh, um, uh, that uh, american scholar uh, who has been translating uh, mughal sources for us it's a beautiful translation in fact uh, uh, the murthy library is uh, coming out with editions on one page you have the persian text on the uh, 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 page which is just the opposite you have the english translation uh, so from this uh, it is very clear uh, that uh, well akbar uh, or for that matter uh, all these uh, uh, emperors humayun as well were trying to pos position themselves as divine kings uh, humayun going to the extent of being a little man uh, you know covering his face uh, with a black uh, or uh, a parda and uh, revealing his face ru numai when he would come before the public uh, and acting as if he is uh, the 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 uh, divine king uh, a god incarnate akbar did not go to that extent but throughout the writings of abul fazl uh, even as i have pointed out that there is no time uh, of, for us to go into those details but even on the walls of the fatehpur sikri the same concept has been drawn uh, some other time we would discuss that yes uh, but we also know that even akbar used to blow into water and give it to people as a cure as medicine oh, yes. so oh, yes. oh, there yes. has there have been these uh, uh, things about uh, mughal emperors uh, there are a number of compliments uh, that the lecture has received uh, rana safavi has uh, thanked you for the illuminating lecture uh, dr zoya zaidi has also is a very illuminating personality so wh whoever tries to speak on akbar <laughs> is illuminated also It is his divine grace. 
Dr. Zoya Zadi says that it is not um, only a lecture but a probe into what is the difference between being a scholar and a literate, which is something that is really important that has been um, uh, put forward in this lecture. Uh, question related to uh, the present times, related to the modern history that we know. Uh, that one is by uh, Gaurav Mathur. Gaurav Mathur asks, how much did Akbar influence Pandit Nehru in endorsing Indian constitution to be secular in its spirit? Uh, thank you for this question, Gaurav. Uh, uh, I think uh, uh, if you read um, uh, Nehru's writings, especially Discovery of India or uh, the uh, letters which he wrote to his daughter, uh, it appears that Nehru, uh, just like Gandhi, uh, derived a lot from our past. It is not only Akbar uh, from uh, whom he derived inspiration, but also from Gautam Buddha. I mean, both these uh, persons, uh, for example, the Ashoka Dhamma of uh, Gautam Buddha, uh, that had a heavy influence on what actually happened in our constitution. And secondly, uh, uh, the, the uh, Sulekul of uh, Akbar. Uh, in fact, uh, the, I may be wrong, I'm not a political scientist. Uh, but you know, uh, we are very proud to say that uh, when we Indians use the term secular, uh, it is very different from what the Europeans mean by the term secular. In Europe, the term secular means uh, distancing oneself from any religious activity, distancing oneself from God, being irreligious. I mean, if you use the term secular outside India, it means being irreligious. But here uh, in Nehru's India, I mean, the concept which we drew is actually the same as was made by Akbar when he propounded his theory of Sulekul, peace with all, absolute peace. Uh, distancing, equidistancing from all, appreciation of all, uh, conjoining the good points of all. So here uh, in uh, for Nehru, uh, Nehru uh, may not himself go uh, to a temple but if someone else from his government, the president of India is going to inaugurate a temple which is being rebuilt, he uh, mildly expresses his doubts, but does not censor him. Uh, because uh, uh, to Nehru, the term secular is the same as the term would have been sounded to Akbar. And that is equidistance. And that is what is needed in India today. Till that definition prevailed in this country, uh, we were uh, leading a better life. Since the moment we have forgotten the ideals of Sulekul of Akbar, uh, unfortunately, we are in for a trouble. I wish for the day when once again, the ideals of Sulekul are followed by the government of India. Any other question? There are certain comments uh, that are there. Uh, Nasima Faridi uh, uh, thanks you for the new and fascinating facts and thanks Ganga Jamni for putting up these lectures. There are certain comments that are there. I'll just read out one of them for you. Um, there is one by Akhlaq Ahan, uh, who uh, again says that it was a wonderful talk. And he uh, puts up a comment and he says he used to have uh, Naqib Khan for reading books. Is there any evidence that he abandoned seeking service post-1590? Uh, he also adds, I have uh, come across some good poetry by him. Uh, uh Thank you, uh, uh, Professor uh, Akhla Khan Saab. Uh, I hope that uh, after this lecture, 
if you have my email or WhatsApp, uh, you would share that good poetry with me. I have been hunting for uh, uh, such thing. Uh, uh, as an answer to your question, I would just say that uh, even Jahangir did not abandon uh, this, uh, uh, you know, reading of books to him. What to talk about Akbar? Uh, yes, uh, not only Naqib Khan, there were a number of others who were reading out manuscripts and texts. Uh, there was a certain time in the Ghusal Khana which was assigned for reading out this material, uh, these uh, you know uh, books to him uh, or to all the emperors. This tradition continued. Uh, we have no evidence, but the evidence which I have put before you is the fact that uh, they, uh, in that particular passage, it is not Naqib Khan who is uh, reading to Akbar, uh, but it is uh, Akbar who is reading back the text uh, to those who are standing before him. Uh, so uh, we know that uh, from 1590 onwards, or from the period that uh, uh, Akbar came up with the idea of Sulekul, possibly all pretensions were abandoned. Uh, but the tradition of uh, reading out book was an imperial tradition, which was there almost uh, throughout Central Asia. It was there even earlier. It was there even afterwards. So there was nothing special as far as Akbar was concerned. Uh, uh, people do point out that uh, Akbar ko padha jata tha or as if it was not being read out to Jahangir. Uh, you know, unfortunately, I am a very lazy man. Uh, my supervisor once had given me uh, the uh, chance and opportunity of writing, uh, writing on this theme, not confining myself to only Akbar, but to also take into consideration Jahangir and Shah Jahan. I did start some work. I did start collecting some material. And what surprised me was the fact that, uh, uh, you know, uh, reading uh, evidences of reading these works uh, prevailed to a very large extent um, under Jahangir and Shah Jahan. I am not very sure about Aurangzeb. I have not read it myself. I have just read statements that even to him uh, uh, during his period, the, uh, the this practice was continuing. Uh, so to answer you that probably after 1590, the pretension of not reading by Akbar was gone, but there were readers who would read out which was established tradition under the Timorans. Um, Dr. Zoya Zadi again um, asks a very interesting question. And uh, she says, uh, Akbar in his atelier had miniatures which were of size one by one yard and arranged in serial order and stitched together, which he used to watch. This can be called first examples of earliest films. Anything known about these manuscripts? Do we have any uh, um, no, no, information? One of, uh, one of the first uh, manuscripts to be illustrated was in the form of, uh, you know, wall hangings. Um, I'm forgetting the name. Which text is Lubna, which they you know, ne, uh, Dastane Amir Hamza. Hamza was, in fact, uh, 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 were not for the book, they were wall hangings. Uh, I don't know whether it was used for uh, that or not, but I also have evidence uh, which has been noted by Professor S.P. Verma. Uh, you know, you know, S.P. Verma is one of those uh, historians who have worked on the uh, history of Mughal paintings and he has compiled a dictionary of Mughal painters where, where he has given, uh, recorded all the uh, known, you know, paintings of various, uh, you know, artists of the Mughal court. Uh, uh, there, uh, he gives very brief accounts of uh, whatever information is found on each of these painters. Uh, uh, it was, it is during the period of uh, Akbar or it is, uh, yes, probably Akbar. Uh, where he discusses that uh, there is a portrait uh, which is given to, uh, uh, of a uh, uh, Iranian king, uh, which had been made by an Indian painter. 
and when one of the Iranian ambassadors was visiting the court, uh, Akbar asked that particular painting to be brought and asked the, uh, you know, uh, this ambassador, is it true? Is your emperor like this? And the ambassador suggested certain changes, and those necessary changes uh, were made. Uh, during the reign of Jahangir, we know uh, for a fact, I, I wish that a day would come when we would be able to find them once again. Orders were issued by Jahangir to make the portraits of each and every noble of the court. So it was a sort of a catalog of all the nobles. So portraits were uh, drawn of all the nobles. Uh, so possibly they were not only drawn, but cataloged uh, and kept together somewhere. Unfortunately, uh, we just have no information where that all collection went. On the walls of one of the buildings at Fatehpur Sikri, uh, you know, that place is now known as Abdar Khana. It has been identified uh, earlier by Smith as, uh, you know, Madarsa for the girls. Uh, later on, um, Atharabas Rizvi identified as, uh, as the water house, the Abdar Khana. Uh, I also identified it as a place where food was kept before being distributed in the palace. Mm -hmm. Now, in one of the rooms, uh, on the top room of that, uh, there are beautiful dados um, uh, on the walls. And on the dados, traces of the full portraits of nobles still, traces still remain. The actual paintings are gone. But traces of the portraits are there. So possibly uh, portraits of the nobles were made not only by Jahangir, but also during the reign of Akbar. Whether these were being, uh, you know, uh, uh, and you know that, uh, uh, Lubna, you have also written and uh, you have also presented a paper on that. And I have a chapter in my book on Fatehpur yes. Sikri where, uh, you know, mm -hmm. Uh, full scenes have been depicted on the walls, whole narrations, mm. whole stories on the walls of Fatehpur Sikri. The stories of two fighting elephants uh, that are there on that uh, structure, so Nehra Makan, it is called. The temple scene is there, not the temple scene. That you have, you know, a, a scene where mm -hmm. uh, there is a double storied house, people all exactly. around with one person, you know, uh, Patang Bazi. Uh, a boats in the There's river. There's a complete market that is depicted, yes. A full market. Now, whether uh, these were to be seen by the imperial authority, because I'm, I'm, I'm very sure that in these palaces, uh, the laity were not allowed to come in. Uh, even very, very selective nobles would have been allowed to come in. So who were watching these? Uh, possibly uh, what uh, was suggested that these were being uh, used as entertainment for the emperor himself or for the harem or as an aura of his for the select few who would come in. So naturally this, you know, whole, uh, you know, um, genre of paintings was also being used as a symbol of sovereign authority. Mm, thank you, sir, for that interesting, uh, uh, detailed uh, response. Um, this is something that people generally do not know about uh, Mughals uh, because surface decoration and paintings uh, are relatively less worked upon topics uh, when we come to Mughal history. Um, there is uh, uh, another question and uh, that is from TCA Raghavan. Um, he thanks you for the talk and he uh, says that he missed the explanation about Jahangir's references to Akbar being unlettered. What is the reason uh, for that? Uh, Raghavan ji, thank you once again for joining. Uh, we are actually hoping that uh, that day would soon arrive when you would be talking and we would be listening. But I, I think there is still some time left for that. Uh, uh, Raghavanji, the thing is, which I try to uh, talk today is that uh, it is uh, Akbar himself, Abul Fazal, 
and Jahangir. All three of them try to stress the fact that Akbar is illiterate. Both Abul Fazal in his Akbar Nama as well as Jahangir in his Tujuk refer to Akbar as a very knowledgeable person but as illiterate. In fact, I read out a passage where uh, Jahangir says that no one can make out that uh, Akbar is Ummi. Uh, my argument uh, for this is that, uh, and he is very explicit when he says, I mean, he uses the term, and I marked out when I uh, uh, read out that particular passage, that my father could not read or write very explicitly. Uh, possibly, uh, what I tried to argue is that this whole pretension of being an Ummi, just like the Prophet of Islam, I mean, you go and ask any, uh, you know, Muslim and he would tell us with pride that Rasulullah to ummi the. Uh, it is only in the Shia tradition uh, that they point out that when the uh, Suleh Hudaybiyah took place and the uh, pagans insisted that uh, in the uh, treaty which is being signed, instead of Muhammad Rasulullah, it should be Muhammad ibn Abdullah which should be written. And the treaty would not be signed until this word Muhammad Rasulullah is removed. And Ali was supposed to be the scribe and he was writing it. Uh, the narration goes that, uh, you know, Ali just refused. He said, Ke, uh, had I believed that uh, Muhammad is only the son of his father and not the prophet of Islam, uh, uh, I would not be uh, performing this duty. I cannot do it. So the narration goes, and which is a very authentic piece, that the Prophet took up his pen and struck off what was written. So if you ask the Shias, if the Prophet did not know how to read and write, how did he identify what portion to cut and what not to cut? And the reply which we get is the same as the reply which is being given by uh, Abul Fazal and Jahangir, that my father or um, the Prophet was not lettered by anyone from this world. He, being divinely inspired, knew how to do it. So possibly this was the posturing and uh, uh, even by Jahangir, just to show the divine origin of his kingship, just to show how divinely ordained his father was. And that is why he stresses on it, although, as I pointed out at the end of my lecture, that there are evidences that he could read. I tried to read out from Arif Kandari uh, the verses which were composed, but you can say that even an unlettered man can compose, uh, you know, verses, and, and they are not very good verses. But the last evidence which I gave is very ex uh, exclusive that Akbar could read, and uh, possibly Jahangir was. Uh, just attributing something which was not a fact. Uh, thank you, sir, for uh, summing that up. Uh, there is uh, one comment, uh, one question by uh, Erimtan Khan. Um, he asks, did Akbar entertain relations with his Muslim contemporaries in the West? I mean, the Ottomans in Istanbul. We know uh, that Akbar interacted with, uh, sent an embassy to Spain, uh, but yes. Uh, well, uh, whatever evidence we have is that uh, there were letters which were written by Abdullah Khan Uzbek, which had references to the Ottomans. You know, at a time when Abdullah Khan was, uh, uh, Uzbek was under pressure, and there was, uh, you know, a chance that uh, he might not succeed against the Ottoman onslaught. Abdullah Khan Uzbek uh, wanted to uh, in, enhance his suzerainty over the regions of Persia to hold it. Uh, the Ottomans were also eyeing uh, certain re regions of the uh, you know Safavid Empire. It was at that time that letters was exchanged between uh, the Uzbeks and the Mughals. But uh, unfortunately, uh, we don't have any evidence of any direct contact. Uh, between uh, you know uh, Mughals and 
you know uh, that has been one of the banes of the indians they we have always considered ourselves to be insulated from the world uh, alberuni writes that uh, you know the indians believe that there's no one but them uh, by akbar's time at least under the moguls uh, uh, no such feeling existed uh, there was knowledge of the europe there was knowledge of the west there was a knowledge of the east uh, uh, they, they did know that there were other empires uh, which are there to certain empires uh, there were certain attempts which were made to come into contact with uh, we know for example that uh, there were certain kingships uh, with whom uh, to whom akbar uh, in fact had uh, written letters uh, but even uh, to abdullah khan uzbek till the moment the uzbeks did not come to share a com- common boundary uh with the mughal empire akbar did not entertain or reply to any of the letters which were written by the uzbeks themselves what to talk about ottomans uh but uh, they were aware of the ottoman influence uh, you know uh, in as far as uh, the uh, seafaring was concerned at a time when uh, we know that gulbadan banu begum and the uh, uh, women of the harem the merchants the nobles uh they were all uh, been uh, running their ships uh, towards mecca and they were coming into contact not only uh, with the portuguese but also with the ottoman fleets they were very aware of them uh, they were also wary of them but neither the ottomans made any direct attempt towards the mughal empire nor possibly any of the moguls uh, uh, made any attempt uh, to have contact with the ottomans Uh, maybe at some point of time we may get some new information but this is what i have at the moment no contact with istanbul although uh, the moguls were aware that they are mighty kings the moguls uh, never tried to take up the uh, khilafat of the sunni world uh, because the khalifas were after all uh, the ottoman rulers so no attempt uh, on that level was made uh, by uh, the mughal subjects thank you sir uh, for uh, giving a detailed response and for telling us about the relations uh, of akbar with the uh, islamic uh, empires of the west um there is uh, there are a lot of comments uh, there are a lot of uh, 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 gratitude there's a lot of gratitude that is there people are thanking you for the lecture and uh, there is uh, one interesting question uh, i think that would be the last question that we take today because uh, the time is running out there is a question by uh, ashok mathur uh, he asks could you please tell us about akbar's relations with the vaishnavites in the braj region particularly with mahaprabhu vallabhacharya's sect if any information he did seek krishna uh, sorry sorry i missed it can you just put it there so that i may read it also it's a long question can you put it on the screen uh, yes i am um, um uh i can't uh, figure that out i'll just read it out again so uh-huh. ashok mathur asks could you please tell us about akbar's relations with vaishnavites in the braj region particularly with mahaprabhu vallabha vallabhacharya's sect if any information uh, he did seek krishna's philosophy uh you know uh, i think uh, it's a very good question which uh, you have put up uh, uh ashok mathur uh, yeah uh, um ashok ji i mean thank you for this uh, beautiful question which you have put up uh, as uh, you know that uh, we started our lecture series with uh, two lectures uh, on braj bhoom itself uh, uh, dealing with uh, mughal relations uh, with uh, uh, the the uh, vaishnava sect um uh, we uh, i mean in fact i would recommend i am no expert of this field 
so probably i may not be able to satisfy you uh, as far as the import of your question is concerned i can only guide you where you can find the answer and that is in the works of a scholar like j s grewal now uh, j s grewal has edited a work on the religions uh, uh, during the medieval period uh, it's a very voluminous work uh, which has come out uh, there uh, grewal has tried to deal uh, with some of the questions and uh, tried to answer uh, what type of relations uh, akbar had uh, with other sects apart from that there is also uh, a sizable number of articles which have been uh, written by professor rifan habib himself uh, where he tries to uh, deal uh, with uh, akbar's relations uh, with the various uh, you know indigenous philosophies uh, you know uh, akbar did not only come into contact uh, with uh, the uh, you know uh, Uh, Shri Chet Mahaprabhu, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, but uh, he had relations uh, with a large number of other uh, religious uh, uh, groups as well. Uh, we we know that, uh, for example, uh, Devi Chand. Uh, possibly you would be aware uh, about the fact that once Akbar uh, invited Devi Chand uh, to a discussion with him. Uh, Devi Chand was quite old and he could not uh, climb up. Uh, to the place which is known as the ibadat khana uh, so what was done is that uh, devi chand was made to sit at a charpoy and that charpoy was lifted up to the window dharoka uh, which abuts the uh, ibadat khana structure at fatehpur sikri the structure which i have ultimately identified as the ibadat khana and uh, uh, we are informed uh, by contemporaries that the whole night the discussions kept on uh, taking place uh, we also have a large number of uh, you know texts uh, written by the vaishnavas themselves uh, 84 vaishnava ki varta for example uh, where there a large number of legends have been reproduced which try to show uh, that akbar did have uh, uh, you know uh, relations some he attempted to have relations uh, uh, um, uh, with all type of saints and vaishnava figures uh, but uh, the the vaishnava saints themselves spurned the offers i mean uh, in the chara 84 uh, vaishnava ki varta uh, there are verse after verse which says akbar ne hame bulaya tha humne mana kar diya nahi gaye aur phir akbar hamare paas aaye aur unse baat hui uh, so uh, we don't know whether akbar went to them we, uh, we, we heard uh, she was goswami uh tell us on the basis of the documents uh the vinod award documents which he has that akbar never visited jahangir visited uh, we also have uh, the paintings of jahangir where he is uh, meeting other saints uh, going to them and not calling them to his court so uh, there were uh, many type of you know uh, uh, relations with all type of people so possibly uh, uh, this is uh, one of the aspects krishna after all was supposed to be uh, one of the prophets of islam and that is what dara was also talking about uh, mm-hmm. there was you know many uh, moguls exactly. who would believe that he is one of the prophets uh, of islam himself uh, so uh, there were relations but i am not the best pa- person to answer you this question exactly every question here is uh, a potential uh, discussion a potential lecture on its own and uh, if we go on like this uh, the discussions the questions the answers the arguments can go on forever but we we'll have more lectures we we'll have more interactions just, just, just um, a moment libna yeah, just to- a, just a moment libna uh, there is a comment by raghavan saab it's a very interesting comment and that is why i'll just pick it up uh uh you know the way i answered him so he says thank you for that uh but he adds you would not agree this could be because of the numerous frictions between jahangir and his father uh no sir uh, i would not believe that you know that uh, friction was very temporary and the type of uh, uh, you know relations which existed between the father and son uh 
possibly i mean uh, jahangir takes care never to criticize his father throughout his tuduk so even if there was some pain in his heart about those bad days uh, when uh, you know he had revolted against his father maybe it was there but throughout his tuduk there is no iota of even an inkling that uh, he had differences with his father so i don't believe that uh, he is uh, because of the friction uh, with his father he is calling him as uh, you know ummi as i said that ummi has uh, uh, turned into a very sacred term it simply doesn't mean illiterate there are other words which could have been used the uh, choice of the word ummi itself points out uh th- that uh, it is you know trying to relate it uh with the prophet who was also considered to be ummi so this is not uh, you know something which is uh, uh you know um, uh, in rancor but this is something mm-hmm. which is in praise which uh, jahangir is putting up for his father there are paintings uh, which show jahangir as looking up to his father Uh, he uh, got his uh, portrait of his father made along with him so uh, there was uh, after uh, he became the emperor jahangir tried to uh, uh, sort of emulate his father uh, that is um, so uh, thank you sir uh, 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 just a moment uh, i know you are quite tired but just last comment and then i'll stop mehru jafar uh, uh, has asked Uh, what was the political reason if any to insist that akbar was illiterate it was not uh, i mean it was a very good reason uh, uh, throughout the medieval period there were attempts being made to uh, relate the kingship with divine authority uh, from the very beginning as i said from uh, mm-hmm. sultan dalban onwards uh, there were attempts uh, to to uh, position the emperor i gave you the example of uh, you know um, uh, humayun humayun also tried to position himself as a divine king akbar also i mean in fact uh, his whole court uh, which uh, uh, he he uh, elaborated upon although it is in astrological astronomical terms but actually he is alluding it to the divine authority ke everyone has uh, a place of his own and in the center just the divine king uh, should rule just like the sun over uh, the stars uh, uh, so uh, possibly uh, uh, mehru jafar uh, uh, the, the the answer to your question is uh, that uh, the uh, reason behind such posturing uh, the insistence that akbar was illiterate was very simple uh, to position himself next to the prophet uh, allah hai अल्लाह का रसूल है और उसी के फॉलोइंग में कोई खलीफा वगैरह नहीं है वो सल्तनत पीरियड में खुलफा के नायब हुआ करते थे सुल्तान हुआ करते थे यहाँ बादशाह है देर इज यू नो कुरानिक वर्स विच वॉज इन्वोक बाई ऑलमोस्ट ऑल दीज रूलर्स अतिल्ला अतिर रसूल व उलमर मिनकुम ओबे गॉड ओबे दी प्रोफेट एंड दोज इन अथॉरिटी एंड मुगल्स थॉट that they are the authority so obey god the prophet and soon after the prophet no question of a khalifa it is we who are so ottomans may be the khalifa of a section of the muslims safavids may be the representatives of the uh, imams but we the moguls are uh, the uh, you know authority from god and and i'm sorry uh, uh, i mean i'm taking time but uh, probably i may not get a chance after this uh, aurangzeb the 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 uh, nishan which aurangzeb uh, writes to sends to rana raj singh at a time when he is trying to take up the kingship he is uh, he is in war with his brothers it is at that time that he solicits the help of the uh, rajput rulers and he writes a letter uh, to rana raj singh and there he invokes the same concept he says who are the king kings are nothing but the pillars of the court of allah and if the emperor is weak the whole court of allah would collapse and just as allah is for everyone the hindu the muslim the christian and so on and so forth so is the king 
if he discriminates between any of them, he is going against the divine order. If king is the zillallah, the people are khalqullah. So this whole concept uh, is not only of Akbar, not only of you know uh, Balban, but it continues uh, to quite. Uh, Aurangzeb never practiced on that uh, when he became the king. That's another matter. But in theory, he invoked the same concepts as were being invoked uh, by the policy of Sulaykul of Akbar. And, and that was uh, that it was the divinely ordained king. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, there would be many more lectures uh, on uh, the questions that have been put up. There would be many more discussions, hopefully. Um, we will end uh, this lecture uh, on this note. Uh, we will. Uh, we wish everybody a very happy new year, a uh, good week ahead. Uh, we hope to see you next Thursday uh, with uh, our lectures. Uh, thank you so much, sir, for giving so much time, for giving uh, such detailed attention on every aspect. Um, I thank the audience for putting up such amazing question and we hope to see you next Thursday. Thank you. Uh, just a moment uh, before we end and uh, we say the final goodbyes. Uh, the tradition is that we inform you about the next program which we are uh, going to have. And uh, uh, my next program uh, which we would be taking up uh, is uh, in the new year uh, uh, with this lecture, unfortunate lecture because all of us were expecting a glamour here with uh, Dr. Catherine Schofield uh, before you in talking about novels, music, and uh, you know films showing uh, you know from uh, Mughal Azam. Unfortunately, that could not happen. Uh, uh, but then this is the end uh, of our programs of the 